Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We'll now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council, which was also attended by the Commission Vice President, Mr. Dombrovskis. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We continue to expect them to remain at their present levels, at least through the summer of 2019, and in any case for as long as necessary to ensure the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. Regarding non-standard monetary policy measures, we will continue to make net purchases under the asset purchase program at the current monthly pace of 30 billion euro until the end of this month. After September 2018, we will reduce the monthly pace of the net asset purchases to 15 billion euro until the end of December 2018. And we anticipate that subject to incoming data confirming our medium term inflation outlook, we will then end net purchases. We intend to reinvest the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the APP, the Asset Purchase Program, for an extended period of time after the end of our net asset purchases. And in any case, as for as long as necessary to maintain favorable liquidity conditions and an ample degree of monetary accommodation. The incoming information, including our new September 2018 staff projections, broadly confirms our previous assessment of an ongoing broad-based expansion of the euro area economy and gradually rising inflation. The underlying strength of the economy continues to support our confidence that the sustained convergence of inflation to our aim we will proceed and will be maintained even after a gradual winding down of our net asset purchases. At the same time, uncertainties relating to rising protectionism, vulnerabilities in emerging markets, and financial market volatility have gained more prominence recently. Significant monetary policy stimulus is still needed to support the further build up of domestic price pressures and headline inflation developments over the medium term. This support will continue to be provided by the net asset purchases until the end of the year, by the sizable stock of acquired assets and the associated reinvestments, and by our enhanced forward guidance on the key ECB interest rates. In any event, the Governing Council stands ready to adjust all of its instruments as appropriate to ensure that inflation continues to move towards the Governing Council's inflation aim in a sustained manner. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. Euro area real GDP increased by 0.4% quarter on quarter in the second quarter of 2018, following growth at the same rate in the previous quarter. Despite some moderation following the strong growth performance in 2017, the latest economic indicators and survey results overall confirm ongoing broad-based growth of the euro area economy. Our monetary policy measures continue to underpin domestic demand. Private consumption is supported by ongoing employment gains, which in turn partly reflect past labor market reforms and by rising wages. Business investment is fostered by the favorable financing conditions, rising corporate profitability and solid demand. Housing investment remains robust. In addition, the expansion in global activity is expected to continue supporting euro area exports. 
This assessment is broadly reflected in the September 2018 ECB staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area. These projections foresee annual real GDP increasing by 2% in 2018, 1.8% in 2019, and 1.7% in 2020. Compared with the June 2018 Euro system staff macroeconomic projections, the outlook for real GDP growth has been revised down slightly for 2018 and 2019, mainly due to a somewhat weaker contribution from foreign demand. The risks around in the Euro area growth outlook can still be assessed as broadly balanced. At the same time, risks relating to rising protectionism, vulnerabilities in emerging markets, and financial market volatility have gained more prominence recently. According to Eurostat's flash estimate, Euro area annual HICP inflation was 2% in August 2018, down from 2.1% in July. On the basis of current futures prices for oil, annual rates of headline inflation are likely to hover around the current level for the remainder of this year. While measures of underlying inflation remain generally muted, they have been increasing from earlier lows. Domestic cost pressures are strengthening and broadening amid high levels of capacity utilization and tightening labor markets, which is pushing up wage growth. Uncertainty around the inflation outlook is receding. Looking ahead, underlying inflation is expected to pick up towards the end of the year and thereafter to increase gradually over the medium term, supported by our monetary policy measures, the continuing, the continuing economic expansion, and rising wage growth. This assessment is also broadly reflected in the September 2018 ECB staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area, which foresee annual HICP inflation at 1.7% in 2018, 19, and 20, which is unchanged from the June 2018 Eurosystem staff macroeconomic projections. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money M3 growth declined to 4% in July 2018 from 45 in June. Apart from some volatility monthly flows, M3 growth is increasingly supported by bank credit creation. The narrow monetary aggregate M1 remained the main contributor to broad money growth. The recovery in the growth of loans to the private sector observed since the beginning of 2014 is proceeding. The annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations stood at 4.1% in July 2018, while the annual growth rate of loans to households stood at 3%, both unchanged from June. The pass-through of the monetary policy measures put in place since June 2014 continues to significantly support borrowing conditions for firms and households, access to financing, in particular for small and medium-sized enterprises, and credit flows across the euro area. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed that an ample degree of monetary accommodation is still necessary for the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. In order to reap the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute more decisively to raising the longer term growth potential and reducing vulnerabilities. The implementation of structural reforms in euro area countries needs to be substantially stepped up to increase resilience, reduce structural unemployment, 
and boost euro area productivity and growth potential. Regarding fiscal policies, the broad-based expansion calls for rebuilding fiscal buffers. This is particularly important in countries where government debt is high and for which full adherence to the Stability and Growth Pact is critical for safeguarding sound fiscal positions. Likewise, the transparent and consistent implementation of the EU's fiscal and economic governance framework over time and across countries remains essential to bolster the resilience of the euro area economy. Improving the functioning of economic and monetary union remains a priority. The Governing Council urges specific and decisive steps to complete the banking union and the capital markets union. And we are now at your disposal for questions. Mrs. Kolimowski. Piotr Skolimowski, Bloomberg News. Uh, Mr. Draghi, uh, first question is, um, you've decided to reduce uh, bond purchases from, uh, from October, but you still left the ending of the program at the end of the year open uh, to, or dependent on the incoming data. Could you walk us through the arguments behind that decision? Why leaving the, the ending of the program still um, open? Um, and my second question would be, based on the, on the forecast you've received today and the discussion that you have, um, would you say that the, the output gap in, in the Eurozone is already closed or is close to, clo to being closed this year or we still have to wait for that to, to happen in next year? Thank you. Thank you. The answer to the second question is that we've seen growth rates uh, now for some time above growth potential. And to the first question is basically, we haven't discussed uh, this. Um, my reading here, what, uh, uh, what uh, is here, we will reduce the monthly pace until the end of December, and we anticipate that subject to incoming data confirming our medium term inflation out, we will then end net purchases. I, I think that's the text, that's what we've discussed. We haven't elaborated on that. But let me make clear that it's when we stop, uh, this doesn't mean that our monetary policy stops being accommodating. The amount of uh, accommodation will remain very significant. And uh, through our investment policy and through our forward guidance and interest rates. Thank you. Mr. Fellas. Thank you, Tom Fellas from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, your new economic forecasts suggest that inflation will hover around 1.7% for the next two and a bit years. Is that consistent with the ECB's mandate and the decision to phase out QE? And in relation to that, second question, shouldn't the ECB be aiming for, be, shouldn't the ECB be aiming for an overshoot on inflation? I'm sorry? Uh, shouldn't the ECB aim for an overshoot on inflation rather than an undershoot, given that it's been below target for so long? Thank you. Thank you. The answer to the first question is yes, it's consistent. We have, uh, we have, uh, we, are, we are seeing convergence, and that's what the discussion of today confirms. We're seeing convergence of the inflation rate to our aim, and we have confidence that this is happening. Confidence based, based prim first and foremost on our monetary policy, which remains accommodative, and second on the underlying strength of the economy. The uh, improving, ever improving conditions of the labor market uh, will may elaborate on that, but certainly the last number is, is also quite uh, significant. The latest number about employment, it says that 9.2 million jobs being created in the euro area since 2013, and rising wages. So we are confident that our present monetary policy stance is consistent with, uh, with our aim. Second point, our objective is uh, an inflation rate which is below but close to 2% over the medium term. We stay with that. That's our objective. Ms. Jones? Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, first of all, I'd ask, like to ask about the, um, whether or not there was any discussion or even a discussion of when you will have a discussion on the reinvestment policy. Um, I'd also be interested in your personal view of this idea floating around of an Operation twist style operation that could perhaps be tailored to the needs of specific Eurozone member states. 
Thank you. Well, thank you. No, we, frankly, we haven't discussed, and uh, we haven't, as I said last time, we haven't even discussed when we are going to discuss it. Uh, now, having said that, we have two meetings before year end. So uh, we either discuss next time or in December. And uh, so it's just a matter of, uh, of we'll take this decision in the coming days, really. Uh, and it was going to be at level of committees first and foremost because it'll have to be prepared, properly prepared. Uh, other than that, as you've seen from my reading, the reinvestment uh, statement is exactly the same as before. Now, on, on, so uh, we haven't discussed either the Operation Twist or uh, whether to reinvest in different maturities. But what I, I think what I said last time, and I can confirm that, and uh, even though we haven't discussed, I believe the Governing Council would be pretty unanimous on that, is that the capital key will remain the guiding principle. Ms. Bufaki? Isabella Bufacchi from Sole 24 Ore. So uh, uh, even if it looks open-ended, let's say that QE is about to end. And uh, there is a growing confusion in Italy, I think, about what QE has been really all about. Uh, some people think that the QE is a sort of securities markets program and that the end of QE will mean that Italy in particular will be abandoned left alone to fight against the attacks of speculators. So I don't know whether you want to comment on what Q QE is really all about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, it's actually a comment I've made on, on other occasions, different contexts. The mandate of the ECB is price stability in the medium term. And uh, QE has been uh, one of the tools we used to uh, pursue this uh, task. Uh, in the past, uh, the ECB was asked, uh, why are we keeping, for example, interest rates uh, negative and we are uh, depriving the savers from, uh, from their income? Or why are we hurting insurance companies, bank banks through low interest rates? Uh, as I always answered, it's not the mandate of the ECB is not to protect bankers' profits or insurance companies' profits. And in this case, responding to your question, is not to ensure that government deficits would be financed under all conditions. So our task is to, 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 uh, to pursue price stability. That's what... Uh... Mr. Malin? Jan Malin, Handelsblatt. Um, uh, Mr. President, you've mentioned um, increasing risks concerning emerging markets. Um, the currency crisis in Argentina and Turkey seem to have contagion e effects on, on other emerging uh, markets. Um, how much of a threat is that for, for the Eurozone economy and the world economy? And my second question is, the current problems in the emerging markets seem to be related at least partly also to Tight, the tightening of monetary policy in the U.S. and the withdrawal of liquidity. Um, the ECB also anticipates to, to stop net purchases uh, next year. Um, what, what kind of risks do you expect when the two main central banks uh, reduce liquidity? Thank you. Thank you. Well, concerning the first questions, the increased uncertainties in some emerging markets is certainly one factor that adds to the general uncertainty in, in world markets. But having said that, so far, the spillovers from Turkey and Argentina to other countries have not been substantial. Again, once again, as we've seen two or three years ago with similar uh, crisis in emerging markets. Once again, it is shown that the countries that are most vulnerable to contagion are the countries which have the weakest fundamentals, namely high current account deficit, high inflation, high budget deficit. But the current, but other emerging market countries that have better fundamentals have not been affected. I think that's that's a key. Uh, that's one one key consideration, which is also in a sense 
is from seen from the perspective of the eurozone is reassuring that so far we've seen quite limited uh, quite limited uh, contagion at least in the aggregate now of course we can have individual situations of uh, significant exposure to local uh, to local crisis and that's different because that would affect individual entities but not in the aggregate now one of the uh, one I, I think I listed three sources of uncertainty. One is uh, the, general, the general change in the situation of emerging markets, which, by the way, doesn't include only Argentina and, uh, and Turkey, because big changes are also happening in China of a different kind, however, not, not financial stability related. Uh, the second source of uncertainty is indeed the potential, we haven't seen much yet, so, but it's, it's one of the risks we're looking at, we are certainly monitoring, uh, the potential financial markets volatility generated by changes gradual as measured pace, as, as you know, changes in monetary policy in the, in the main jurisdictions. This is one potential risk of enhanced financial volatility. And, uh, and we're, also, we're also monitoring that, but certainly, the major source of uncertainty that we see in uh, in global in global uh, in global uh, output uh, comes from the rise in protectionism, and uh, that is uh, that is the major source of uncertainty, which, by the way, is reflected uh, in the current macroeconomic projections only to the extent of the measures that have been implemented already. So the current projections do not reflect measures that have been announced, measures that have been threatened. And clearly there we have to look at uh, basically uh, three factors that may make this, uh, this uncertainty more severe. One is clearly the, uh, to, we have to see, we have to assess the extent of an escalation. Uh, that is one, uh, one factor that certainly we, we have to look at. And, uh, the so-called confidence effects. Uh, what sort, be, besides the effects on, on prices and tariffs and quotas and volumes traded and so on, what is going to be the effect on general confidence of, a, of an extended trade war? Uh, that, is, uh, that is certainly a second, a second factor. The third factor, which makes any assessment quite difficult, is to see is to, to, to assess uh, what are the implications on the international value chain of changes in, in tariffs of a significant and broad and significant proportion. Ms. Weisbach. Hi, Annette Weisbach with CNBC. Um, I would like to ask you what you think about the remarks by um, the head of the European Commission, Mr. Juncker, in his State of the Union address. He was calling for the euro to be an international reserve currency, which could potentially rival also the US dollar. Would you support that as the ECB, as an institution? And then let me bring you back 10 years ago when the Lehman crisis was uh, just yeah, happening, like the, the anniversary is, is this Sunday or Saturday. Um, if you think back, what was the biggest challenge for you and in also the years afterwards to, to fight the crisis which started then. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the answer to the first question is we are really interested to see what are the proposals of the Commission and we stand ready to cooperate with the Commission on, uh, on defining or enhancing the international role of the Euro. As you know, it's not part of our mandate, but we certainly stand ready to, uh, to work with, with the Commission and with with the, uh, with, the, with the other member states. Um, on the second question, the, um, well, the, uh, it, it's, this answer could be very long. So uh, I will, um, I'll tell you what I would like to remember of that period of time. Um, first of all, for, for, uh, for us, the crisis actually started before Lehman. The first, the first serious signs of an impending crisis actually date back to September 2007. So much so that by the end of 2007, the G7 and right after that, the G20, decide to task the, what was called the FSF, the Financial Stability Forum, which is the precursor 
of the Financial Stability Board with a response to the crisis. And uh, the uh, FSF created at that time uh, a working group uh, with, uh, across countries and produced an answer by April 2008 with 77 recommendations, most of which have been implemented and others are still in the way of being implemented. So that was the first answer. What I remember of that, of that uh, instance is the extraordinary effort of international cooperation at world level. In other words, even before Lehman, it was quite clear that the financial crisis was coming and uh, it would have uh, unprecedented proportions and uh, was worldwide. And this is what was at the basis of this uh, uh, really unprecedented and uh, international effort. Um, I can say that uh, since then, there hasn't been one aspect of the banking business that had not been touched by the regulators and the supervisors. Uh, all this effort was, in a sense, crowned by the agreement that was found by the, uh, by the Basel Committee and by the GEOS, the uh, Governors and Heads of Supervision in Basel at the end of last year. So it took 10 years to actually crystallize uh, the effort, which, by the way, was already in, uh, had been, many parts of this had already been introduced in the supervisory practices and in, uh, in the regulation. In, uh, uh, now, current, current developments are, worth also, are also worth looking at. In, uh, in other jurisdictions, we, um, we could uh, sort of fear a backtracking uh, to a world where there is less regulation. In the European Union, we don't see that danger. We don't see that danger. As a matter of fact, there are, the banks are stronger. Just imagine, just, just look at this. The common equity tier one ratios were something like uh, around 8%, 8.5% in 2008, now are 15.6% for the banks. The leverage ratio was 3.7% way back then, and now it's over 5%. Also, liquidity management, uh, morale, uh, risk management, governance have all been overhauled by the uh, regulator, by the legislators, by the regulators, and by the supervisors. So, all in all, uh, the banks are stronger today. But uh, are we? Can, can we actually be, in a sense, complacent? And the answer, of course, is no, because in the meantime, a, a lot of this business has migrated from the banking world to non-banking world, so-called shadow banking. So the next step will be to ensure that equally strong regulation and supervision, of course, one has to take into account the differences in institutions, would, would also be applied to, to the non-banks. Thank you. Mr. Canepa? So back to policy, if I may. Did you discuss changing your policy message to say that the balance of risk was tilted to the downside? And the second question is about Italy, and it's about the fact that bond yields have risen in recent months. And how's that affecting financing conditions at large in Italy and in the periphery? Well, the answer to the first question is no, we haven't changed the... Uh the balance of risk uh, about uh, growth can still be assessed as broadly balanced. At the same time, risks relating to rising protectionism, vulnerabilities in emerging markets, and financial market volatility have gained more prominence recently. So the balance of risk hasn't changed. Now, why hasn't it changed? Uh, because we've seen that we have, I've listed just a series of downside risks. There are also upside risks one of which is the fiscal policies. Fiscal policies in several uh, Euro area countries are gonna be probably less uh, uh, neutral than we had uh, expected uh, uh, some time ago. That's one, but the other um, much more important consideration is that we are observing an underlying strength of the economy that makes us think that the downside risk is gonna be mitigated 
by this fact, by the, as I mentioned before, the improvement in the labor market and the rise in wages, which are the main drivers that support consumption. Private consumption is supported exactly by these two drivers primarily, and only secondarily by the increase in wealth, in household wealth. And investment, investment is also being supported by the quite, uh, quite um, accommodative financing conditions, and, and, the, and the, even though they have tightened somewhat since the last meeting, they, the lending conditions to, to uh, firms and households remain, remain very, very favorable. Um, so the, uh, that, that was the, the answer. The second question was about Italy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me say something I was um, about to say before when I was asked about Italy. Um, first of all, uh, words in the last few months have, have changed many times. So what we are now waiting for is facts. And the main fact is the draft budget law and not only that, and the subsequent parliamentary discussion. And we have to see how that is. And then, and, then, and then savers, capital markets, investors will formulate their view. Now, unfortunately, we've seen, as you said before, as you hinted before, no, we've seen that words have created some damage. And, uh, and interest rates uh, have gone up. And have, they've gone up for households. And they've gone up for firms. However, um, and by the way, all this, this is another interesting point, all this hasn't created much of a spillover to other Euro area countries. So it's remained pretty, at least so far, pretty much an Italian episode. Now, having said that, uh, we have to uh, basically uh, uh, be aware that uh, the Italian Prime Minister, the Italian Minister of the Economy, the Italian Foreign Affairs Ministers have all said that Italy is going to respect the rules. Thank you. Mr. Pellino. Marina Pellino from Rai, Italian Television. Um, I go back to Italy, but uh, this problem with the spread could be um, a possible challenge for the global market, and then um, so that the, the European Central Bank ha could uh, decide next year uh, to um, take other measures to, uh, so like in the past, uh, so that Italy do doesn't go to be a, con a contagious uh, reason. And the other side, uh, Mr. Moscovici said today that Italy is a problem for the European Union and for the Eurozone. Uh, what do you mean about this opinion? Look, I, I answer the first question is we haven't seen any contagion yet. So and the second thing is, uh, I repeat what I said before, the ECB will stay with what the Italian Prime Minister, the Italian Minister of the Economy and the Italian Foreign Affairs Ministers have said. Namely, that Italy will respect the rules. Mr. Neubacher. Bernd yeah, Neubacher, I'm with Börsenzeitung. Um, today, there's been a recommendation by the private sector group to um, um, take the ESTA as a new euro risk free rate. I, I'd like to know if the ECB um, is endorsing that decision. And secondly, I'm wondering about the fallback rate. Um, as far as I know, the ECB was trying to deliver ESTA as a fallback rate in case the private sector could not agree on a new benchmark rate. Now the question is, if uh, ESTA will become the new Yonia, um, what will be the fallback rate? After all, banks uh, need a fallback rate when they use such a systemic benchmark. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, today, uh, just uh, not long ago, the private sector working group has recommended to use the euro short-term rate, that's why it's called ESTER, euro short-term rate, uh, as uh, an alternative free rate as replacement for IONIA, 
that no longer meets the criteria of the EU benchmarks regulation, and we will see, and it will see its use restricted as of the January 2020. So we welcome this decision, and because also it brings the euro area closer to other jurisdictions where this issue is being addressed already. Now, of course, we want to state clearly that the private sector plays the dominant role in ensuring a smooth transition, but this transition has just started. There is a subgroup of the working group, led, by the way, by a, by a, a, a former colleague of mine in the executive board and a countryman of Mr. De Guindos, uh, Gonzalez Paramo, Mr. Gonzalez Paramo, that uh, is actually, uh, will oversee exactly the point you raised, namely what should be done to ensure the robustness of the contractual arrangements that uh, are based on, uh, on other benchmark rates on Euribor and Eonia. So we, we can't say much about the future of Euribor because that depends very much on the administrator of Euribor, of Euribor and uh, on the regulators, namely ESMA and FISMA. Thank you. Mr. Jakesh? Klaus on Jakesh, ARD German Television, Mr. President. I also would like to touch a more um, historic dimension. Your predecessor, Jean-Claude Trichet, in an interview described um, uh, or expressed his uh, concerns about the situation that we have a high volume of debts at the moment worldwide, comparing it with the situation 10 years ago when debts also triggered the, count, uh, the, the previous crisis. Um, do, you, do you agree with his assessment, which is quite strong, I think? And if so, are you actually also concerned um, that um, this high volume of debts, although it may be different now than in the past, may uh, be able to trigger a new crisis. Thank you very much. Yes, I do agree with this assessment, uh, which uh, is also the assessment of the IMF now has been saying for several months that debt levels worldwide are, remain high or in some parts of the world have gone up. As far as the euro area is concerned, however, things are slightly different uh, in a, not in the sense that debt is, is not high. Debt is a high in the euro area as well. But uh, private debt has actually gone down. And it, gone, it went down and uh, a significant deleveraging has taken place, both in financial and non-financial parts of the economy, so that the balance sheet of uh, both financial companies and industrial manufacturing companies is now much stronger than it was before. I mentioned before some of the numbers concerning banks, but the same could be said about non-financial corporations. So de private debt has gone down, public debt stays high. And that's why we always say that, uh, that uh, countries where public debt is high should be the first to rebuild fiscal buffers because uh, otherwise if we have a new crisis, they don't have any policy space. Mr. Heighton. Uh, Luke Heighton, Market News. Um, I have two questions, Mr. Draghi, if I may. First of all, is it conceivable that the bank could raise rates and steps of greater than 10 basis points uh, after the end of the current forward guidance period? Uh, and secondly, is the ECB prepared to respond to any slowdown in Eurozone growth or inflation by delaying an increase in its overnight lending rate to banks? rather than adjusting its other key rates or resorting to more asset purchases? I'm sorry, both questions might be in principle very interesting questions, but we haven't discussed that. So well, I'm pretty sure there will be a time when we'll have to discuss these questions, but it's now premature. Thank you. Ms. Laird? Thank you. Laurie Laird, MT Newswires. Uh, Mr. Draghi, did you discuss at all uh, the signs of a weakening in industrial production toward the end of the summer? You spoke about your optimism for the Eurozone economy. Some of the data we've seen recently um, may give cause for concern. And a second question, uh, do you have any discussion at all about the fiscal uncertainty in the U.S. presented by the upcoming midterm elections? 
Yeah, well, we uh, answer the second question first. I mean, we, we di actually didn't discuss that uh, in, uh, to any extent, other than saying that two things that I can remember of our very short discussion is that this fiscal expansion is pro-cyclical, and uh, there are dangers that it could uh, that its effects could wane uh, in 2020. So the risk there is of an increase in interest rates accompanied by a weakening of economic activity. That's, I think, the only point that was briefly discussed in the various presentations uh, that were made about the state of the world economy. On, on, the, on the, first, the first question is, yes, we had this drop in industrial productions, but again, it, uh, this was uh, looked at as, um, I would say one of the signs of convergence of the economy to its steady state path. Namely, we had quite unusual strong growth last year based uh, also on a, a pretty strong unusual export performance. Now, the world, the world, uh, the, world the, I mean, the external part of, of this growth now is getting weaker and therefore we do expect some weakness in the domestic part as a reflection of that. At the same time, the domestic part remains resilient uh, because of the consumption and investment performances I've hinted at before. Uh, so all in all, yes, we've taken note of that, but, and that's where really the, there was unanimity of the governing council, uh, but the view of the Governing Council, unanimous view of the Governing Council was that um, the present monetary policy stance is robust. Namely, even if there are limited changes in policy parameters due to the various, uh, various effects we just discussed, the uh, policy stance doesn't change. Mr. Lacour? Agence France Presse. Uh, because uh, Annette Weidman, uh, Weidman uh, uh, didn't mention it, uh, let me, with a few days delay, on behalf of my colleagues, wish you a happy birthday, Mr. President. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was not my final word, uh, so keep on smiling. I have two questions. Um, qu quick follow-up question on the, on the risks. You said they are broadly balanced, but I want to know if it was the a view that was shared among the whole governing council or were some members maybe a, a, a in favor of a more darker expression to take account uh, the threats we know about. And the second one on the emerging uh, uh, economies, um, um, the worst um, sign that we see is that the, 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 the currency are losing value and so this is reflected in the euro exchange rate, the weight uh, traded exchange rate, which um, apparently uh, reaches its highest level since 10 years. And it seems to be some uh, topic of concerns for some members of the governing council. So is it uh, something that you discussed today? Now, the, uh, the answer to the first question was, the question is, was the assessment that risks are broadly balanced shared by all governing council members? The answer is yes. It was shared by all. Of course, there were different nuances because uh, countries uh, are growing at, still, by the way, the dispersion, I often mention this, uh, this number, the dispersion in growth rates, in, uh, in growth value added across the euro area is at its lowest historically. But we have to go back to the early 90s to find the same uh, low rates of dispersion. But still, uh, when you look forward, you certainly have countries where, uh, where growth is more buoyant, countries where growth may be less buoyant and downward revisions may be more significant. But, and that may well be not because of external factors, but because of uh, endogenous facts that we haven't seen yet, really, so we, are, we have to appreciate that in the coming months. But the assessment, the overall assessment was shared by all governors. The, uh, about the emerging market countries' exchange rate effects on the euro area, uh, we briefly touched on that uh, in, in a sense when, uh, in, in one specific context. 
When we say that uh, uh, the foreign demand is weaker for the euro area, and this may be due to the stronger exchange rate of the euro, we have to keep in mind that uh, the uh, depreciation of the Turkish lira actually accounts for much of that effect. So uh, that was the, the context in which we, we, uh, we discussed, briefly discussed that. But we have to say that really, uh, the, in the aggregate, uh, what's happening in Argentina and Turkey uh, so far doesn't show any significant spillover. Uh, although, uh, at the level of individual institutions, you, one may well see significant exposures to local realities. Mr. Di Vittorio? Di Vittorio Lefonti. Uh, does the European Central Bank or economic staff exclude that uh, a country in the Eurozone by the end of the summer of uh, 2019, 2020, will go into recession? And the second question, for your opinion of European Central Bank, the QE has been used well by the various uh, euro area countries. Thank you. Well, the answer to the first question is, by and large, yes. It's been, it's, been used, uh, it's been used well in the sense that the intended effects of the QE, mind, I speak for the aggregate of the euro area, and this holds also for the other question you asked me. Uh, we, we, we can speak for the aggregate of the euro area, and we project what I just said about growth rates for the 2019, 2020. Uh, but uh, in terms of going back to whether countries have used it well or not, yes, I mean, they used it well in a sense because we see a pickup in growth everywhere, a reduced disper dispersion in growth rates everywhere, an employment situation which is by and large improving almost everywhere. Now, some countries more than others. Now, if your question is meant to say, shouldn't have governments taken advantage of the situation of such low rates to decrease budget deficits, to restore? Well, they should, they should do it, certainly. They should definitely do it. Rebuild fiscal buffers, take the opportunity of low interest rates to carry out the sound economic policy with a budget which is growth friendly. And keep in mind that this is a good situation for doing that. And the final question today for Mr. Schroes. Thank you, Mark Schröer's Börsenzeitung. My, my first question is on, on your growth and inflation outlook. Um, you, you describe your growth outlook as broadly balanced. Um, what about the outlook for inflation? Is this also broadly balanced, or is it to the downside or to the upside? And my second question is on reinvestment. You, you mentioned earlier that um, it's also up to the committees to, to discuss that. Uh, would you say that these reinvestments are first and foremost a technical process? And have you today explicitly asked the committees to come up with proposals on reinvestments? Thank you. We, the, about inflation, I said inflation is gonna hover around the present level for the rest of the year, and then I gave numbers for next year in 2020. Basically, these numbers are the result of two different components. We project uh, slightly lower oil prices, but significantly stronger core inflation. And that's because of the underlying strength of the economy and the rise in wages. Uh, now, of course, wages, nominal wage growth is higher in countries that, uh, like Germany and lower in other countries. But, but by and large, even though underlying inflation remains muted, by and large, we see pickup in wage, nominal wage growth uh, everywhere. So this leads us to say that, um, that the projection of inflation we given, which is the result of these two components, will reach our objective over the medium term. Um, was this your question, no? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. We don't carry the same risk analysis for inflation as we do with growth. To some extent, but not completely, to some extent, the two things are interrelated. But this assumes that uh, lower growth translates immediately into lower inflation in the long term. Now, there have been times when this was true. There are times when this isn't true. So we have to judge there, basically. So the projections that we have on inflation reflect oil prices and all the other components 
of the of the inflation rate definition. Uh, the other question, sorry, was reinvestment. Oh, the reinvestment. No, I mean I said the committees because certainly it, 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 it's, it's simple. It's not a simple question. So it has to be worked out technically well, and then we can uh, we can actually discuss in the governing council. But there will have to be preparation to that extent. Thank you. Thank you very much.